This is Sports and Torts with David Spada and Elliot Harris on TalkZone.com. Elliot, let's get right to our next guest. This gentleman, he pitched for, looks like, eight different teams. The Indians, Twins, Dodgers, Expos, Cardinals, A's, Pirates, Athletics. I didn't know there was that many teams back then. What Cat Grant, how you doing? Pretty good for old Stepper. How did you get the name Mudcat? Well, when I um, I was a walk-on in spring training, they didn't have a draft way back in 1954, and I was a walk-on. Uh, by the way, uh, Hank Greenberg made sure that uh, I signed a, a contract. He was the general manager for the Cleveland Indians at that time. But... Um, uh, when I walked on, I was a little ragged kid from La Coochie, uh, Florida. And back in those days, most people thought, I should say most whites thought, that the average black person was from Mississippi. And so my compadres uh, nicknamed me Mississippi Mudcat because they thought that I was from Mississippi. And um, uh, I was tagged with it at that time, uh, Mississippi Mudcat. And a little bit later on, they dropped the Mississippi, and it was just Mudcat. And that's how I got the name by mistake. Being from Florida, <laughs> it it could have been, you know, it could have been Gator, but I'm happy with Mudcat. Gator Grant has a certain sound. To it. Did you have a nickname <laughs> before you were Mudcat? No, not really. I, as a basketball player, they used to call me Rip because um, when I used to shoot the basketball in high school, it was didn't hit the rim or nothing, just hit the bottom of the net. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the only other nickname that I had. But the Mudcat stuck. So, were you better at baseball or, or basketball? I, you know, I was all state uh, in basketball, um, all state in the football, uh, and um, I wasn't a bad baseball player. But getting to the major league is the essence of everything. So I, I gotta, I gotta say that I was a better baseball player than than basketball or football. When you joined the Indians, who was on the team back then? Well, when I joined the Indians, uh, Larry Doby, I roomed with uh, Larry Doby. Uh, Bobby Avila, who won the band championship in 1954, uh, was there early win, Hall of Famer. Bob Lemon, Hall of Famer, uh, was there. Uh, so, yeah, there were uh, George Strickland, of course, was there. He was with the um uh, World Series back that way back then, fifty four, I think it was. Right. He was there. Uh so there were a few you know, ball players there that were really terrific uh ball players and historical people, um, uh, because of the circumstances back in those days. Uh Bob Feller had just just retired. Al Rosen had just retired. I went to spring training with them. Uh, so I got a chance to uh, uh, to play with some terrific teammates. So, did I, assuming you had a chance to talk to Larry Doby about what it was like <laughs> to be the first African American in the American League, and I sure did. I um, um, went to spring training, of course, before then uh, with Larry Doby before he was traded, uh, and then came back to the Cleveland Indians. So I spent a lot of time. Uh, with Larry Doby, way before, way back there, when they used to barnstorm, African American, American leaguers, and National League used to barnstorm. I got a chance uh, to meet Larry. I was trying to meet Jackie Robinson, but um, uh, Jackie was real busy doing one of those barnstorming trips. And Larry Doby, I felt kind of bad uh, because Jackie was real busy, and this guy. He said, young man, um, I, in fact, I was about 16 at that time, but playing um, uh, in the Florida State Negro League. And uh, Larry Dover says, uh, my name is Larry Dover. I know you want to meet Jackie, but uh, uh, we'll meet him a little bit later. So I met uh, Larry way back there. Why weren't there any black pitchers uh, back then when you started? There was very few. Don Newcomb was one, but other than mm-hmm. Don Newcomb and you, there weren't many. No, uh, Joe Black, mm-hmm. you know, he um, 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 was uh, in the league with the Dodgers way back there. 
Uh, there were a lot of black pitchers, but a lot of them was Sad Sam Jones uh, was back in those days. Uh, but uh, a lot of them was in the uh, minor leagues uh, at that time. But even so, there wasn't a lot of, 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 of black pitchers back in those days. I, I started out as a shortstop, and I didn't get changed into a pitcher until 1957. I had signed in 54. But even in, in the leagues that I, I came up in, in the minor leagues, we only had one or two or three uh, African-American pitchers back then. Was it kind of like the stereotype in the NFL with black quarterbacks? The black pitchers weren't smart enough? Yeah, yeah. You know, that's, that's the way it was. In fact, uh, I remember um, Jackie and uh, Larry and Joe Black, uh, they told me that, hey, say, listen, uh, this is just the circumstances, but um, – uh, you can be a terrific ball player, but when you cross those white lines, they said, you ain't, it ain't about you should win. You better win <laughs> back in those days because that's the way it was. Uh, uh, they just didn't think that uh, we, you know, uh, qualified uh, as a smart pitcher or a pitcher on our own. It seems like we had to have more instructions back in those days because they didn't think that uh, uh, we were really qualified to maneuver a game for nine innings. And, of course, there were exceptions like Don Newcomb and Joe Black and Sad Sam Jones. But you really didn't have the luxury of being a mediocre pitcher. Mm-mm. <laughs> like, like they said, you better win. Uh, there was no doubt about that. Even though I thought that uh, I survived by being in the middle of the pack, I was not a Don Newcomb, I was not a Bob Gibson, or, or even a Sad Sam Jones, who had a terrific curveball. Uh, I got a chance to meet uh, Satchel Paige. Uh, but by by being able to pitch, uh, I would say complete games back in those days and being able to uh, to to really get on the mound and take my turn, I had that chance of of, uh, of staying in the big leagues a long time, 14 years. Then you went to the Twins and you get in the World Series in 65. That would be some thrill for you. That was a great thrill for me. There were so many things happening back in those days. The Civil Rights Bill was, was was passed uh, in 1964, uh, and uh, that was part of our lives back in those days. But um, uh, Sandy Koufax at that time uh, was the starting pitcher for the Dodgers, and we played the Dodgers in the World Series. And um, uh, it was <laughs> it was one of those things in the neighborhood. It was an African American against a Jewish ball player which uh, a pitcher which was the uh, the big deal uh, back in those days and it would have been the first time it ever happened uh, in the World Series but Sandy uh, because of his religious beliefs uh, didn't start that game uh, and then we never got a chance to face one another but because by starting a day later it was always a day later that we both uh, couldn't face one another. But uh, I became the first African-American pitcher to win a World Series game in the American League, and my boy, my grandkids, my great-grandkids are having a ball with that. Who would Sammy Davis have rooted for, you or uh, Sandy Koufax? <laughs> I understand. I understand <laughs> what you're saying. <laughs> In view of the fact that uh, Sammy became Jewish, that would have really been something that I went to, yeah, the same route as Sammy Davis Jr. But it no one, just, no one probably ahead. asked you that before. No, you got that right. But I'm glad you did because that I, that would be part of my repertoire from now on when I speak. <laughs> now, in recent years, the presence of African American ball players in the major leagues seems to be less and less is, is there any way to change that? You know, it, it's like you work so hard to, to integrate the game and become a dominant part of the game. And now it seems like basketball or football 
yeah. uh, takes away a lot of those athletes. Is is, is yeah. baseball just something that's almost an afterthought uh, to a lot of kids? I think so. It, it's been uh, a big change towards the interest, even in the uh, uh, black community. They seem to have forgotten um, the history uh, of baseball. And uh, even in my own family, you know, there's a bunch of kids. There's a, I got a bunch of uh, nephews uh, that's playing uh, football and basketball, and when I talk to them about baseball, um, man, you know, they say, oh, no, 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 I got to play some football. And I don't know how we're going to change this around. Uh, I was home. I live in L.A., and I was home uh, on Mother's Day, and my nieces and they said, we got to get them to play uh, some uh, uh, baseball. And uh, we, I am so concerned and worried about uh, the fact that uh, we're slowly disappearing from the game, and we're not as significant as we used to be in the game, even though we, we do have uh, a few African Americans in the game, but we're disappearing, and it's so hard uh, to keep the interest of baseball from an African American standpoint. Uh, I speak all over this country, and uh, I tell single mothers who have boys to to get them to play uh, the game of baseball, but um, they seem to be more interested in the fact, and maybe. The news has something to do with that. They see many more basketball and football players than they do uh, baseball players. But they have to keep on working on this and um, because this wonderful opportunity that happened back there during the days of Jackie Robinson and, and uh, Larry Doby, this wonderful opportunity uh, is, still exists, and, and we got to work so hard to make sure that that community knows that. What's your website? Uh, my website is theblackaces.com. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, well, let me put it this way. Um, uh, there's 14 African-American pitchers only that have become 20-game winners, and certainly hope that uh, David Price um, uh, does it down there in Florida. Uh, but... Um, um, yeah, the blackaces.com, I wrote the book, uh, and you can go there and get that book uh, uh, on that website. Now, you put, did you, what was the process of putting that book together like for you? It was really something. I, you know, I, I played in the Florida State Negro Leagues um, uh, way back there uh, in the uh, late 40s. Uh, but I... Um, uh, I had known and played for uh, some of the old Negro League players that had retired in, uh, in Florida. Willie Wells uh, was there. I got to know Satchel Page as a youngster and so forth. Um, but I really didn't know a lot of the history of the game until I thought about doing the book where I thought that uh, African-American history was disappearing. And, man, putting that together uh, with my two co-writers, who were white, by the way, at that time, but interested uh, in the uh, history uh, of baseball, it was mind-blowing because the more I, – I thought I knew a lot. I didn't know anything until I started uh, putting the book together. So it was really a, a type of thing uh, that uh, made me realize how – how vast um, African-American history is in the game of baseball, and I was grateful for that. I see that you met a couple presidents. You met, what, John F. Kennedy back in the day and then former President Bush? Uh, the Kennedy story was amazing. Do you want to tell it? Yeah, well, you know, it, it, it was back, way back there in his first year of the presidency. And um, um, back in those days, they had um, uh, presidential suites actually where presidents stayed when they came in uh, 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 into a city, a big city. You can't do that anymore, of, of course, but back in those days, and he was in Detroit, uh, President Kennedy, and uh, he was having breakfast, and it just so happened that the Cleveland Indians, whom I was with, 
um, was in Detroit to play the Tigers, and he <laughs> and and he was having and he looked at the uh, paper, and I was pitching that day, and um, uh, he said, "I bet you they are staying in a hotel." Uh, and then um, um, somebody found me, and uh, they called me, and they said, the president would like to have breakfast with you. I said, oh, yeah, 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 sure, because we were still getting difficult phone calls back in those days. I hung up the phone. I hung up twice, and the third time they knocked on the door, and they said, the president really want to have uh, breakfast with you, <laughs> and I was flabbergasted. I went down, and there he was. And uh, we uh, talked for about 40 minutes. And uh, we talked about civil rights, and uh, we talked about difficulties. We talked about segregation. And um, uh, he said something to me. He said, I know some of the things you are doing uh, in communities. He says, what can I do for you? And I hear the president of the United States asking me what he can do for me. And I said, I would like a school because I graduated from a segregated school of hand-me-down materials and, and, and so forth. I said, we don't. So we are in a, still in a lumber mill school. And he was flabbergasted by that. And uh, he said, really? I said, yes, sir. Uh, I said, um, I would like to see if we could get a school in La Coochie, this little lumber mill town, and I would like to see if we could get uh, books, brand new books, brand new crayon, you know, uh, brand new reading materials, he says, I think I can do that. I says, can you do that? He says, I think I can do that. Well, uh, what else? And I says, well, we are still living in lumber mill housing, and the lumber mill is closing, and there's no place for the community to live. He said, well, we can't have that happen, so... Uh, from that conversation with him, we got housing, we got a school, we got a park, we got books, uh, and so forth and so on. And um, it was a great thing uh, that happened when I called my mother about this situation. She said, boy, what you been smoking? <laughs> 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 and then, of course, we were invited to the White House when President Bush uh, was in the um, was, was the pre- was the president, and uh, we were invited there. Some of the uh, black aces was invited there for uh, Black History Month, and it was it was a great meeting. You know, we uh, we discussed some things, and uh, he was really happy to sit down and chat with us. And the one thing he did do, though, Don Trail Willis was one of the aces that came and. And um, um, the president wasn't supposed to introduce us at that time, but but he was excited. He says, "Okay, I'm going to introduce the aces." And when he got to uh, Don Trail Willis, he says, "And we have that left-hander, uh, twenty-game winner, uh, uh, Montel Williams." <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds like the second President Bush, pretty much. <laughs> And we were sitting with Condoleezza Rice. <laughs> I mean, she just dropped her head. And everybody groaned. And uh, he said, uh-oh, uh-oh. He said, did I make a mistake? And about 300 people in unison said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, had, um, we had a great conversation. I had a great conversation with him. And uh, we we talk we talked about some things that could be improved in the community and so forth and so on. So so meeting those two presidents and and meeting um, President Johnson, uh, meeting Vice President Humphrey, uh, it was really something. Those conversations that we had and some of the plans uh, for communities and so forth and so on in discussion with these presidents and vice presidents was really something that my mother always was glad to hear. What about Obama? You haven't met President Obama? I want to do that. I, I have not, and I know he's a basketball uh, fan, you know, but I got to get to him some kind of way and talk to him about baseball. He can't throw a ball. He looked like a girl throwing the ball. <laughs> know. You know, he does the best he can. <laughs> I know it. I got to teach him some things. Maybe the aces, maybe we can all meet him one day. I, I certainly hope that. Uh, there's been an effort 
you know, by uh, some people that I know, but nothing has happened yet. And I certainly hope that one day uh, that uh, uh, can happen. I, I don't have to uh, tell you how proud I am the fact that uh, uh, in my lifetime uh, we've had an African-American president of the United States of America uh, and the uh, terrific person that he is and what he's doing and just to shake him ha- shake his hand would be great and and uh, for my great grannies who already have seen photos of me and uh, these these great leaders and then to add that boy that would be terrific now just tell him you're going to make him an honorary black ace and I think you might be able to pull it off yeah yeah that may happen because um he need um, he needs some work on his throwing form I tell you that <laughs> you can, don't feel bad. Earl Lloyd, the first black player in the NBA in the Hall of Fame, was supposed to meet President Obama, and he left before he had a chance to meet him. So, Yeah, okay. Thank you again for your time. You got it, my friend. All righty, thank that you. That was Mudcat Grant. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll have on Basketball Hall of Famer Bob Curlin. Stay tuned.